the Alliance for Safe Biologic Medicines, as you can see on the next slide, is an organization composed of diverse healthcare groups and individuals, from patients to physicians, and including innovative medical biotechnology companies and others, who are working together to ensure that patient safety is at the forefront of the biosimilars policy discussion. In the next slide, in our next slide, you can see that we are a resource which provides information about issues related to the safety and quality of biologics. We advocate for policies that allow the doctor and the patient to choose the best course of treatment. And lastly, we work to seek solutions that ensure affordability and accessibility of biologic medicines while never compromising on patient safety. On our website, which is on the next slide, which you can reach at www.safebiologics.org. We have a plethora of information for you. So after this webinar is over, and if you need some information, I'd strongly encourage you to go to the website. Uh, you can see the, the issue background, the uh, policy resources. We've got a section on frequently asked questions. This site is very helpful. I, I would strongly encourage you. Uh, to take down the website, www.safebiologics.org. And this will provide you with a one stop to get the key information you need regarding biologics and biosimilar drugs. Can we go on to the next slide, please? There's been a lot of talk and a lot of media attention recently about drug shortages. Uh, in fact, Congress is holding hearings uh, this week. Uh, at this time, uh, it appears that product recalls, production breakdowns, shortages of raw materials, and reduced economic incentives are contributing to these shortages. And this is currently being looked at by Congress. It's a significant problem. Uh, from 2005 to 2010, the number of prescription drug shortages has tripled. And I have seen that in my office uh, already. So it is a significant problem. Uh, we will be addressing this in greater detail at, at a future webinar. There is a place for biosimilars in the marketplace, provided patient safety comes first. And, and that's, that's the key issue. We have to have drugs that are safe and efficacious. Uh, these shortages will need to be worked out so that they can uh, be corrected. Because right now, due to the shortages, we are seeing ration. We're seeing rationing in the hospitals. And we're also seeing uh, rationing occurring at the office level. So as I said, we'll have more, more of that uh, at a future webinar. Okay, next slide, please. So what are biosimilars? They're often referred to as follow-on biologics, uh, generic biologics, or follow-on proteins. They're actually new versions of existing trade name biologic products whose patents have expired. Although they are similar, and that's where we get the term biosimilar, they are not identical to the reference product. They do not utilize the same living cell line, production process, or raw material as the innovative drug. So they're, they're being made by a different process. They're not identical to the, uh, the brand name drug. Uh, Okay, next slide, please. These are some examples of uh, biologic medicines. I'm an endocrinologist. I use insulin. That was one of the first biologics. Uh, but you can see here the many other drugs and treatments that are available for these other diseases. There are actually hundreds of uh, biologics on the market today. And they treat everything from diabetes to multiple sclerosis to hemophilia. Uh, cancer, hepatitis, and their role in medicine today is increasing. In fact, by the year 2014, it's projected that six out of the ten top-selling drugs in the U.S. will be biologics. Uh, some of these will be facing biosimilar entry. I know in the world of oncology with cancer, out of your top 10 drugs, a large proportion of those are currently biologics. 
with the use of biologics, we've been able to treat diseases in ways we haven't ever been able to treat before. They've been a real godsend. They've been real miracle drugs. So these, as I said, are some examples. And can we go on to the next slide, please? Now, what's a biosimilar and what's a generic? Let me walk you through this slide. And on the next slide, I have a diagram and pictures that I think will we'll put some flesh uh, on the bones here. But let me walk you through this slide. The drugs you're probably most familiar with are the small molecular chemical drugs. They're made out of a few atoms. They're easily characterized. They're relatively simple. They're made by a chemical process, in essence, made in a chemistry lab. On the right, the biologic medicine, they're made from living cells. It's not a chemistry reaction that we run and we get a product at the other end. You know, with, with uh, chemistry reactions, for example, I, I like to use the example of uh, HTO, uh, H2O. You put two hydrogen together, one oxygen, you get water. You always get water. That's a chemical process. The biologic medicines are made from living cells. And the way I like to describe it is this is really farming at a molecular level. <laughs> we should call these people molecular farmers because they grow they grow this product, and I'll show you more in a second. But it's a very complex product that, that is produced, difficult to characterize. Now in the left lower portion of the slide, we, we have generic. The generic of your small molecular drugs has the identical same active ingredient. So it's got the same uh, chemistry, the same uh, molecule, identical strength, dosage form, and route of administration as the reference drug. On the right, the biosimilars, they're never identical because they're using unique cell lines which cannot be replicated. Maybe one way to explain it would be like a, uh, a rose bush. You know, if you grow two rose bushes in your backyard, they're both rose bushes. They're similar, but one bush is not identical to the other. And that's how it is when you're working with uh, living materials, living organisms. And w once again, the small molecular weight drugs, it's made through chemistry, biologic drugs, we, we really grow them. It's the difference between a production product, for example, an automobile production line, you know, for the chemical drugs, where you get identical products coming out, versus farming, on the other hand, where we actually raise your, pro your product, grow your product. But let me show you on the next slide. I, I think this might make it a little more clear. On the left, we've got aspirin. That's a small molecular weight drug. It's made through chemistry. Weighs about 180 Daltons, 21 atoms. Fairly simple, very small. Very small when compared to biologics. The next drug to the right is a biologic. And you can see it's made out of 191 amino acids, about 22,000 Daltons it weighs. It's got over 3,000 atoms. It's human growth hormone. And that's a relatively simple biologic. Yet, look how much more complex it is than that aspirin. And now as we move further to the right, look at IgG1 antibody. That is a huge molecule. Over 1,000 amino acids, weighs about 150,000 Daltons. It's huge compared to aspirin. It's got over 20,000 atoms. So you can see we're working with a much more complex uh, a group of drugs here. And that's why the Hatch-Waxman Bill, or Act of 1984, doesn't apply. It applies to drugs that are identical. What we're working on now with the biologics and biosimilars, we're working with drugs that are similar but not identical. Prior to biosimilars entering the market, key policy questions must be addressed with a science-based, transparent approach that seeks the input of major stakeholders and puts patients first. I want to thank everyone today for participating in today's webinar. The Alliance for Safe Biologic Medicines has been very active over the past year working to provide information that will help the FDA ensure that patient safety is the focal point of everything they do as they work to bring biosimilars to the U.S. Our members strongly support the FDA and have confidence in the work they do. 
and we're looking forward to the regulatory pathway that they will shortly be laying out. We hope that they will call on us individually and collectively as they undertake this very important task. We hope that our webinar series will lead Alliance members, the General Patient Committee uh, community, and others to work with policymakers in the FDA to assure that the public can feel confident that the biosimilars are safe to come to the marketplace. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, I would uh, encourage you to go uh, to the chat box on your screen and type in any questions you might have. And after this webinar is over with, if questions come up or if you need to contact us, I strongly encourage you to go to our website, www.safebiologics.org. Uh, we can be reached there. And we'd be happy to work with you on this very important issue. So thank you for your attention today. Hi, Dr. Dollner. Uh, we have a yes. few questions here that I'd like to read out to you. Uh, oh, first, that's fine. The first one is, how do we ensure that the doctor-patient relationship is kept strong? Oh, we need to do everything we can to, to maintain that relationship, because that's where the key decisions regarding life and death treatments are made. Um, currently, over the last few years, there's been a greater and greater uh, push on, on narrowing down that relationship, having third parties make medical decisions actually. And whenever legislation like that comes up or whenever that occurs, I, I think we need to address it uh, because what you're doing is changing the focus of that decision-making process to that third party. And value judgments can't be made by third parties. They're best made by the individual. And those value judgments regarding what treatment would be best, what care to give are best made in the, in the uh, office between the doctor and the patient. Uh, specifically, what can be done? I think if legislation uh, is uh, being considered that would uh, decrease the, this uh, relationship, I, I think it needs to be stopped or addressed. Uh, I would encourage everybody to do their best to fortify the, the patient-doctor relationship because someday, all of us are going to be patients. Someday all of us are going to be in that doctor's office. And someday, we, it, for, for sure, it would be best if, if we were making those decisions, we as patients, uh, rather than a third party. Thank you, Dr. Dallin. Our second question is, how much more difficult is it to make a biosimilar than a chemical generic? And I just ask that you speak into the microphone just so everyone can hear. Thanks. OK, fine. It's much more difficult to uh, make the biologic drug. Uh, as I showed with that uh, slide with the uh, process there, uh, chemistry, manufacturing chemical drugs is, is relatively simple. And we don't need as much data. We don't need as many. Uh, uh, points during the process to check it to make sure that it's going appropriately. With the development of the biosimilars and the biologics, when you're developing a biologic, there are many, many data points that need to be obtained, many measurements taken, many processes are, are gone through to develop the product. And once again, we're growing it. The, this is coming from living cells. This is, in a sense, like farming, uh, but much more complex. So that the whole process is much more complex, much more difficult. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dallinar. The third question is actually about the American Medical Association. Uh, they recently edited their position on biosimilar medicines and opened the door for automatic substitution by a pharmacist to switch a patient's medicine from the reference biologic to a biosimilar without physician consent. Uh, you've talked at length today about how biosimilars are not generic. As a doctor and representative of the Alliance, what are your thoughts on this policy change? Um, I think the issue of interchangeability and automatic substitution is, is a very important one. And in fact, we will get, be getting into that uh, on the web, next webinar, webinar number three. Uh, but I can say for, sure, for certain that there should be no substitution without the physician being involved. 
or at least notified of the substitution. Otherwise, we're working in the dark. I, I see patients every day in the office. If I'm writing a prescription that says do not substitute, and then a pharmacist substitutes that medication and I'm running into problems, I don't know. I didn't know that he substituted the drug. That can be a real problem. On the other hand, if the pharmacist calls me and says, Dr. Dallinar, we've, we've got this other drug that I'd like to substitute, can I have your permission? And I, I agree to it, well, that's fine. If, if we run into a problem, we know we had switched to a different drug, maybe we need to go back to that first drug. So I think at a minimum, at a bare minimum, the doctor needs to be notified. I don't think that the drug should be switched without this notification. It all comes back to patient safety, and I think that's the safest way to do it. Okay. Uh, we have a next, our next question is about Europe. Uh, we know that Europe is ahead of the U.S. in the approval of biosimilars. Are there things that we can learn from them, from Europe? Yeah. I, yes. I, I would direct you to our, to our website. Uh, we've got information there. Uh, they've approved uh, seven drugs as of this point, and they are ahead further ahead uh, down this road than we are. Uh, so I, I'd strongly encourage you to go to the uh, website and uh, we've got information provided there regarding the European experience. Okay, so our final question is, what is the most important thing that we should be seeking from the FDA right now? Uh, in two words, patient safety. I, I, I think that's the key thing. Uh, we don't want to sh cut any corners. We want to make sure that these drugs, as they come to the marketplace, they're safe, they're efficacious. Um, that's the issue. It's all about patient safety. Uh, that's the key thing. And, and, and that's what our organization is, is working to, to keep up front in this discussion, uh, to make sure that drugs are adequately tested, adequately evaluated before they come to the marketplace so that we, we can be assured that they are safe, they are efficacious, and we can use them in our patients. Uh, Dr. Dalinar, I'd like to thank you today for uh, spending your time and explaining to us the issue of biosimilar medicines. Um, uh, if anyone has any further questions, they can email media at safebiologics.org, and we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you.